This message is intended as a reminder that we are not licensed professionals, not psychiatrists or psychologists. If you have a serious problem, please seek professional help. The National Suicide Hotline is 1-800-273-8255. That's 1-800-273-8255. There's some damsels in the DM. Yes, queen. <laughs> Tell us what's the vibe. Uh-huh. What's the vibe? There's some damsels in the DM. Yeah. Hey, please tell us what's the vibe. Uh-huh. DMs, DMs, yeah, we see them. Yeah, we read them. DMs, DMs, we don't need them. We just leave them. Please. Yeah. It's going down in the DMs. Bye. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of Damsels in the DMs. I'm Lauren. And I'm Alejandro. And today we have the privilege of being here with Leanne Yao, who is the founder of Polyphilia and is a educator and advocate of polyamory and non-monogamy. So hello, Leanne. Hi, so happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me on. Thank you so much. We're so excited to have you and talk a little bit about this world that I think so many of our listeners don't really know very much about. I'm oh, super, super sorry. curious about you and your polyamory journey you know why did you start uh sharing on social media i started sharing um and blogging about my life um on social media uh partly at kind of the uh, encouragement of my friends because basically um i made a bit of a name for myself at university for being like the polyamorous person and a lot of people were already kind of coming to me for advice on open relationships and like exploring that side of themselves and like queerness and and that kind of thing and then eventually you know like i was just kind of like you know like people across university who like I didn't even know would be kind of reaching out to me on Facebook and going like oh you know I would love your opinion on like xyz and then it kind of just got to a point where my friends were like you know you could kind of like just start a blog and so you wouldn't have to be repeating yourself over and over again and you know share your story with like an even wider audience it doesn't have to be just limited to university so I was like oh yeah yeah that's a good idea so then I kind of like I started doing that and um initially it was just like a blog initially I was just kind of writing uh, long form articles. But then um, I noticed that those weren't getting a huge amount of engagement. And I think that's mostly because these days, uh, particularly with the rise of TikTok and um, apps like that, I don't think a lot of people have the time to read like really long articles. One time I, I was just kind of experimenting with different types of content to make. And I thought, oh, well, I could make a meme, see how that does. Um, and so I, ma- I made a meme and I think I used like the, do you remember the surprised Pikachu meme? That was like a thing like back yes, in 2020. Yes, I know you're talking yeah. about yeah, I made a meme with that template and th- and then it massively like took off. And I was like, oh, okay, this is what the people want. Okay. <laughs> um, and then uh, and then it just kind of honestly really uh, just took off from there. And I'm just I, I'm just here like along for the ride, I guess. Um, so I've only been I've only been running this account for like a year or so, like the wow. anniversary. Uh, was literally two days ago. Honestly, it's 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 come so far. Like I I never expected kind of the uh, the following that I would get, like the amount of enthusiasm and how much kind of uh, stuff like this was needed in the community. So um, always always happy to kind of be able to provide that platform for people to have meaningful discussions and like bond over uh, my content and uh, meet other people and all that good stuff. But if you're asking more about like my general polyamory journey because I know there were two questions you asked kind of how did you get started and how did you get started with the blog specifically and Um, I just want to caveat that that what you're just describing is polyphilia as we know it for today just in case people want to go look and check it out as we're talking right now but yes we would definitely love to hear how you knew that you wanted to be polyamorous and even just a brief explanation I think would be awesome we did have somebody who's polyamorous on in our first season but you know just a refresher course I think for second season listeners and maybe people who didn't turn into the first season would be awesome yeah sure um so briefly Um, Polyamory is the practice um, of engaging in multiple simultaneous, uh, usually romantic, uh, kind of committed relationships um, with the knowledge and consent of everyone involved. It is a subset of non-monogamy, and non-monogamy is basically just, as the name suggests, everything that is not monogamy. So non-monogamy is like the umbrella term for like any kind of engagement of multiple relationships, uh, like whether they're sexual or romantic or whatever. Um, whereas polyamory is specifically about multiple romantic relationships. Non-monogamy is like anything from open relationships, which is like you and your partner are romantically uh, exclusive, but sexually non-exclusive. Uh, swinging, which is where like couples usually venture out together 
to like have group sex with like other couples or singles um and kind of more like anything that kind of falls within that like that spectrum it could be like monogamish which is like you're mostly monogamous but you'll kind of have a whole pass and make exceptions um so yeah so polyamory kind of falls under that umbrella it's the only uh, relationship style where uh people are not romantically exclusive whereas all other types of non-monogamy are romantically exclusive but usually sexually not so much so i've kind of progressed over time from like practicing general non-monogamy to practicing polyamory so my first ever open relationship was when i was 17 years old um it was a long distance relationship um at the time my partner and i were in completely different continents and it kind of made sense at the time to open up our relationship because Basically, we kind of discussed how basically both of us had very high sex drives. I think that was like the main the main um, motivation for opening up. Mm. And we knew that we would be apart from each other for like six months at a time. And we wanted to have an outlet to kind of uh, get our sexual needs met without like, you know, building re- without resentment building for each other that we weren't able to kind of have that fulfilled while we were apart from each other. And so at the time, it was just like a logical and practical arrangement But then I think through that, like, I discovered much more about myself in terms of, like, you know, how much I appreciate variety in my life, like, how I can kind of develop, like, different kinds of relationships and maybe things that, like, blur the lines between, like, platonic and sexual or sexual and romantic or platonic and romantic. And I liked that kind of flexibility. And over time, you know, I think it slowly kind of eroded my sense of, like, you know, what does exclusivity really bring to a relationship like what value does that bring to a relationship like for myself um and how I realized that like I much preferred honesty and uh communication and um being able to kind of support my partner on their journey and have them support mine uh rather than be like the way we demonstrate commitment to each other is like through through like not having sex with or falling in love with anyone else so that relationship was a while ago and uh we're not together anymore um but not because of the non-monogamy we end of the relationship for other reasons um but I kind of progressed from having open relationships to kind of exploring like group sex and swinging and then kind of eventually moving to polyamory and so my current relationship is actually uh, probably my first like intentionally polyamorous relationship and it's been going on for like over three years now wow interesting can you I hear you uh speaking separately about having an open relationship and being in a polyamorous relationship is there am am I misunderstanding or is there a clear distinction I only ask because uh just recently I actually uh, had a conversation with a friend who was sharing with me their experience of being open he they use the word open rather than um polyamorous so I'm just curious if you could expound upon that a little bit. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I think that the definition of open relationship has evolved over time. I think that in the past, it was generally referred to any type of open relationship, whether it was sexually open or romantically open, like anything, you know, it was considered open. Basically, it was just as long as it's not fully exclusive, then it's open. But then I think these days, I think particularly since people are understanding like the differences between kind of polyamory and other types of relationships, the term open relationship is more usually referred to relationships that are only sexually open, but not romantically open to make a distinction between like open relationship and polyamory. But some people still kind of use it to refer to both, which is confusing. I think also another another caveat that I'd like to add, not all open relationships are polyamorous because some are sexually open, but not romantically open, right? But also not all polyamorous relationships are open relationships because there is a style of polyamory where three or more people agree to be exclusive to each other and are effectively in a closed relationship so like um and that relationship style is called polyfidelity so um it's basically like monogamy but with more people so then it's confusing in that sense because i think a lot of people assume that like if you're polyamorous then like you're just constantly looking for more partners and like you know there is a subset within the polyamorous community where they're like no we we want something that looks like a monogamous setup but instead of two people it's going to be like three or four not all poly relationships are open not all open relationships are poly yeah totally that's interesting thank you huh. what do you think are some other uh, common misconceptions about polyamory yeah, and I wanted to add on to that because I'm not sure if you watched the show Scenes from a Marriage. I haven't seen it, no. 
Okay, so that was a popular show that was just going on in the US with Jessica Chastain. And in the beginning of the episodes, they show another couple that's a polyamorous couple. And what was interesting about it was that they also depict the woman in this polyamorous relationship as not having like really wanted to be in it originally. But then Mm. as she continues in the polyamorous relationship, she's starting to feel feelings for one of the partners that she's seeing in this polyamorous relationship aside from her husband. Mm. And I thought that was interesting because it doesn't necessarily depict a polyamorous relationship as the way I know polyamorous relationships from the people I know who have engaged in polyamorous relationships, but because you're depicting a polyamorous relationship on such a big platform where so many people can see it. And as we've talked about, representation is so important. I felt like that gave a misconception about a polyamorous relationship in that, you know, showing the unhappiness of how they can be. And I would love it if you could like clarify and also talk about a little bit how feelings are not mixed when you're not in a non-monogamous relationship and how it doesn't make the other partner feel as if they're cheating, that it's like an all agreed upon relationship for the people who enter them. I think that in uh, if you're transitioning to an uh, like an open or kind of polyamorous or whatever kind of non-monogamous dynamic uh, from a monogamous one, for like the person who is probably like less on board with a situation or possibly wouldn't choose it if it was up to them, I think it can be there's a fine line between like you know supporting your partner and like compromising and perhaps even like sacrificing like your own. Uh, your own needs and your own happiness there are definitely situations where like someone agrees to a non-monogamous dynamic when they really shouldn't uh when they really should be kind of standing their ground and going like this is not what I want um and this is not like something that will bring me happiness but then on the flip side there's also like well if you try like how will you not know and also if you don't try then that means the relationship ends or like one person is going to be unhappy either way so it, honestly it's it's a bit of a conundrum i really commend couples who are successfully able to make that transition from uh monogamous to non-monogamous because it is absolutely not easy to like upend the foundations of your relationship because i mean at the end of the day i think that monogamy and exclusivity and relationships are so like tied together that when you throw exclusivity out the window like I think people underestimate the impact that that has and and how destabilizing that can be I'm not going to pretend that like all situations where couples open up are like you know fine and dandy and that like everyone is 100% consenting to the situation because like there are sometimes some gray areas. There are going to be gray areas where someone is like, well, I'll try this, but I'm not feeling great about it, but it's not like I have another choice. Mm. And then there are some situations where someone is like, you know, on board with it in theory. And then in practice, they're like, oh no, this is not what I want at all. Um, I think there's going to be, at the end of the day, like a lot of um, curiosities that need to be satisfied. A lot of, um, a lot of question marks that like you can't really answer until like you actually kind of put it into practice. But ultimately, you know, like my page is about like supporting people on, you know, like creating the the relationships that like most fulfill them and, you know, knowing that they have options. My goal is not to not necessarily to like make people like stay in relationships or like like prolong a relationship just because they've been together for X number of years, because if the relationship isn't serving them then it isn't serving them. It's funny that you bring this up. Um, and I appreciate I may be going off on a slight tangent here, yeah, but no, like I had, we love tangents had, here. Yeah. <laughs> like I had I had someone come up to me recently, um, talking to me about kind of me having such a big platform and like being content creator, talking about uh, these kinds of relationships, and they were like, "Don't you think that you have the potential to like ruin a lot of people's relationships? Like if people didn't know that non-monogamy wasn't an option." they would still be married or like they would still be like with their partner. Like, don't you think that ignorance is bliss? And to that, I was like, well, I don't like the idea of kind of keeping people in the dark. Um, And I think that at the end of the day, like having options, like means that you have true freedom. There are some people who, you know, for sure, like could be, you know, happy uh, just being monogamous and not knowing about non-monogamy and like living out the rest of their life and genuinely being very fulfilled. But then there are also some people where that, yeah, like you, you know, you're doing all right in a monogamous dynamic, but like, you could be happier, you could be so much happier. I think some people really kind of underestimate like, you know, the doors that are and opportunities that are like available to them once they discover that like, there isn't just like one way to to practice that relationship style. And I think also, aside from that, I think that 
non-monogamy forces us to challenge so many normative assumptions about like how love and relationships are like. Even if um, you learn about non-monogamy and you decide to be monogamous, I think that there is a lot that monogamous people can take from the non-monogamous community. Uh, like, you know, in terms of like challenging insecurity and jealousy um, or, you know, unlearning like some kind of toxic depictions of love that we see in the media or even things like defining, actually defining your relationship, like defining what the boundaries of your relationship are. Like, I, I'm honestly shocked at the number of monogamous people who don't ever discuss what cheating is in their relationships. Because, like, cheating can mean different things to different people. Like, even in monogamous dynamics, there are some people who are like, oh, um, you know, it's cheating if you sleep with someone else. Um, but if you, like, flirt with someone, like, at a bar, I don't care. Uh, whereas some other people are like, if you watch porn without me, uh, that's cheating. And a lot of people just make these assumptions and don't talk about that. And I think that um, polyamory and non-monogamy in general <clears throat> forces people to communicate and, like, really, really, really make things explicit and clear. Um, and meaning set that boundaries. Understanding. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, so there's less room for misunderstanding. That was, a, like, a, like a long-ass rant. But, like, what I'm trying to say is that, like, um, I think it's better to give people options. And my goal is not to make people kind of stay in relationship for the sake of it. Like, my goal is to give people like the agency to like decide for themselves like what what really serves them I was just going to say I love what you said about how when you first entered polyamory how you had a high sex drive so it just made sense to open up that relationship because I think like if you're hungry you get a sandwich right like we have solutions to our problems and there are options to fix what's making us unhappy and I think sometimes we stay stagnant in our unhappiness because it is the societal norm. And I don't think that we realize that there are so many other options that could be making you happier. And if you just prioritize your happiness and don't think about like, is this going to look weird to my mom? Or is this going to look weird to my coworker? And you just think about, is this going to make me a happier person and have a happier life? Then then you can make decisions that will bring you a better overall life that's more fulfilling for you. Absolutely. Totally. And to add to that, I really appreciate how in everything that you've described, communication is like at the center of it all. I love that. I love that. And I think that's so important for our listeners to really hold on to, you know, and like, just like Lauren, you were saying too, it's like paying attention to what makes us happy and taking into account all of the things that serve us or you know make us feel whole yeah I'm just thinking about this uh, thing that I was taught growing up you know by watching like tv shows or movies or whatever like the expectation that if someone loves me then they'll just get me that they'll like intuitively like understand and I I, I won't have to say anything they'll just know um, mm. and, like and how that like really really messed up kind of like my early relationships like, I only had the one monogamous relationship um before I, I I engaged in my open one honestly like that that belief um the belief that like I, I, I shouldn't have to say anything because like my partner if they really loved me they truly loved me like would understand was so destructive Com communication is absolutely key well, yeah, and, and it, it it makes me think about how in my own life, I work a lot on setting boundaries, just like within my friendships, even just within Instagram, you know, setting a time limit with Instagram. And I think that when you enter regular monogamous relationships, there is the expectation, like you're saying, that your partner is just going to get you, that the boundaries are just understood. And how often are we really sitting down to talk with our partner about like, these are the necessary boundaries, even in just regular monogamous relationships? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think just in general, people don't don't talk enough about yeah. their relationships and rely too much on like love and passion and desire to kind of get them through any everything. Like you know, like we hear so many songs like "Love Conquers All," uh, "All You Need Is Love," etc. And I, you know, I I very much don't don't subscribe to that. Like I think that um, like a working relationship needs so much more than just love and passion. Like you could be very very in love but be horrendously incompatible. Totally. So in addition to uh, communication, I'm wondering if someone is interested in exploring polyamory with their partner, what sort of advice have you given uh, your viewers in, on how to avoid jealousy or overcoming those feelings of jealousy if it's like a, a, a new thing for a couple? I think that jealousy um, is often indicative of something deeper. So then firstly, um, if someone is feeling is feeling uh, jealous, um, I would question kind of what is the core emotion beneath that? 
and I'm taking this from um, a, a book that I was very formative to kind of my early non-monogamy journey, which was The Jealousy Workbook by Kathy Labriola. It contains like 40 plus exercises on like working through your jealousy. And I highly recommend it to like anyone who is really struggling with jealousy and insecurity in the early stages of opening up. In that book, like one of the exercises in it uh, basically talks about how usually jealousy is rooted in one or more of three core emotions so it's usually either fear anger or sadness from there like depending on like which of those three um is like the main emotion that's kind of dominating like the root of your jealousy or maybe if it's like equally like two of them or like even all three of them at once um you can go deeper into that and go like okay like what is it fear of like who am i angry at what am i sad about if i'm going to raise a couple of examples if it's fear it could be fear of abandonment it could be fear of not being good enough. If it's anger, it could be like uh, angry at your partner uh, for kind of uh, um, feeling a sense of betrayal, I guess. Or you could be betraying yourself. You know, you could be kind of sacrificing your own boundaries and you're acting out because like you're actually ultimately angry at yourself. Or you could be angry at your partner's other partner. You Maybe you feel that they're like stealing them away from you. If you're sad, it could be you're feeling lonely. Or maybe you're like accepting the reality of the situation and then you're feeling very despondent about it. It could be like feel like kind of uh, the like sadness that like you're not enough and sadness that like you can't provide like everything to your partner. It could be like, you know, a wide range of things. And then from there, like from your emotions, you can kind of track like the root and the reasoning um, for like why you're feeling that way. I think like a really big thing that I recommend to my clients because like I run peer support sessions uh, usually for you know, people who are opening up their relationships or kind of struggling with anything non-monogamy related, really. Uh, Something that I say quite a lot to my clients is that the unique thing about jealousy is that not only are you feeling bad, but you are feeling bad when your partner is usually feeling good. Like usually your partner's had a good time with someone else and you feel bad. And because of that, I think that a lot of people feel, feel shame about it and they don't want to tell their partner about their jealousy because they worry that they'll drag their partner down with them and to have like a bad time with them. Like they don't want to rain on their partner's parade. And I think like that's, that's like a difficulty that so many people struggle with in the early stages because we're taught like everything should be kind of like happy in a relationship. And like, if we're, if we're struggling, like um, some people are very reluctant to reach out for support or like admit vulnerability or to kind of ruin, ruin like the good time that their partners are having. And I always say, say to people like, don't do that. You know, don't hide it and don't suppress it and don't kind of pretend that the emotion isn't there. It's important to ask for reassurance and comfort from your partner, as well as to do, you know, personal work on yourself and, you know, like learn like self-soothing exercises and that kind of thing. You can't be relying on your partner hundred percent of the time, every time you're having a crisis, but, you know, make that feeling known. I appreciate what you say about um, expectation. That was something else that had uh, come up in conversation earlier this week, where it's like, unrealistic to expect one person to give so much of what you expect in a relationship. It's like, that's not quite fair. How you explain that uh, was really, really profound. There's a psychotherapist um, who has delivered a couple of really fantastic TED Talks and has written a lot of books and done a lot of public speaking about kind of the idea of like expectations in relationships and particularly desire and how that is cultivated in long-term uh, partnerships. Uh, so her name is Esther Perel. Oh, um, yes, know her very well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so Esther Perel, most famous for her book, Mating in Captivity. Like, I, I think that like her work on um, kind of like desire and particularly kind of infidelity and that kind of thing uh, has been so illuminating. And while she doesn't kind of explicitly talk about non-monogamy and polyamory and like all of her stuff. Like, I think that a lot of her work is very non-monogamy friendly. Like, I think a lot of the things that she says like rings true and like uh, is very like applicable to non-monogamous dynamics because she talks about like, yeah, like expectations that we have in relationships, you know, how a lot of people expect their partner to like give them comfort and security and calm, but then they also expect like mystery and excitement and passion. And those two are very different things. And, you know, I think you really have to work quite hard to be able to kind of cultivate those two things simultaneously, Uh, particularly like the longer, you know, the longer you are in a relationship with someone, like as she says in one of her TED Talks, like how can you desire something you already have? You know, how do you want something that you already possess? Well, not possess, but you know, like you already have it. So then you're like, 
desire is usually in something that like you don't have yet and you are like yearning for and you don't have that yearning like when you're in a long-term relationship because they're at your side you're living with them you're married to them and I think that this conundrum like she like the way she brings this up is so interesting and it raises so many questions about are we expecting too much like from from monogamy like do we have to kind of pick one or the other and are we able to do that and live like long happy fulfilling lives and I'm sure that is possible for some people but then um, I do also think that to be able to maintain like a lifelong monogamous romantic relationship which I think very few achieve these days because we live much longer than we used to I think you have to sacrifice quite a lot of things I think you have to make a lot of sacrifices in order to kind of maintain that um and sometimes I think that like maintaining the relationship comes at the expense of your own happiness Mm. and I'm curious in what you have seen in your personal life and in general in successful non-monogamous relationships how often are you communicating to your partner what you're feeling for another one of your partners or what's happening with another one of your partners? Like how, I guess, useful is having that conversation or not useful? So I think it really depends on kind of the nature of what I'm sharing. Like, I think my partner and I have boundaries regarding uh, like what details to share and not to share. And I think the important thing here as well is to consider the third party in this situation, because it's not just about how much I want to share, how much they want to know but also how much my other partner is comfortable with me sharing with them. So then there's like, you know, privacy concerns and it's not just like always kind of centering uh, the couple um, in, in this situation. It's also kind of everyone else that like this decision affects. I'm generally pretty comfortable with hearing like whatever uh, from my partner, like within the boundaries of like what his other partner has been comfortable with, with them disclosure, disclosing. Like, I'm generally happy to hear about, like, anything. Like, if he goes on a date and then comes home and then um, he tells me about, like, what they talked about um, or, like, you know, if they had sex, uh, like, you know, what kind of new things he learned, what new things they tried, like, I'm, I'm happy to hear that. You know, I'm always very excited about it. And I think generally he's pretty receptive to me, like, kind of sharing the same with him. But there, I remember there have been some instances where, like, we've come, a- come across, like, areas that have kind of made the other uncomfortable. Uh, here's an example I use a lot so uh, my partner is bald my partner has been losing his hair ever since I've known him um so I'm I'm 23 he's 25 and we we've known each other for three years so like he's been losing his hair since he was like 20 and it's a point of insecurity for him I think like a lot of men um are like insecure about their hair and so like if I go on a date with someone um who like has really amazing hair um I remember like one time like I went on a date with someone who like had like you know really long like curly hair and I, I came around and he was like yeah, how was the date and I was telling him about it and I was like oh my god and like touching his hair was like so gorgeous I could just like run my hands through it and stuff and he was just like I'm feeling uncomfortable about like you sharing this because like it's really kind of tapping into like my insecurity and I was like oh oh yeah no that's completely fair you know obviously like he has to kind of do his own work to be like confident in himself and like accept his body for what it is and that kind of thing but also in the meantime I shouldn't be kind of triggering him by talking about other people's luscious locks constantly (laughs) you know (laughs) so like there's these balances to be found right like I think there's um there's always kind of room to accommodate um and I think like there's a very fine balance to be drawn between like yes you know like work on your own stuff but also like support them and it's not too much to kind of like ask to like be able to make small adjustments and accommodations right like I think it's absolutely fine if people don't want to share too many details like we're very open with each other but I know other people who don't want to hear anything at all really like they're just like I just want to know you had a good time I don't need to know like whether you had sex or not or like you know whatever the only things that I would say people should really kind of communicate about are like things that would actually affect them so for example you know things relating to like sexual health you know like if 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 your partner like had sex with someone else then you probably need to talk about like uh potential exposure to stis and like how you're protecting yourself and like what your risk profile is and like kind of like what barriers you you use or not and how regularly you're getting tested how regularly they're getting tested all that kind of stuff like all these are logistics like practical things that like need to be need to be talked about but then beyond that like do you really need to know like where like you know like what kind of like kinky sex your partner and their other partner had like no like you you don't need to know that (laughs) like um and so I think it's up to each individual relationship to decide for themselves like how much they want to hear how much they want to know and there's absolutely no shame in like not wanting to kind of talk about that stuff like I think it's the same with like if you're talking with friends or if you're talking with your siblings some people love talking about sex with their friends 
uh, some people are less comfortable with that. It doesn't have to be a like a source of shame, like if like you feel uncomfortable with your partner kind of sharing um, information about their other partners. Um, I think that's important to make clear because a lot of people are like, oh, I feel jealousy and therefore this is bad. And it's like, well, no, like it's okay to have boundaries. My last question before we get into this letter, just because I'm curious, on that same topic, what about sharing when you're sad, like about something with a partner ending? Do you think that's also okay? Or is, does that have potential to make people also feel bad? I, I think that like if your partner is going through a breakup or like if you're going through a breakup and you are maintaining your other relationships, I would encourage people to kind of support the partner who has been, who is going through this period of grief and loss to, to support them in the way that they would like to be supported. Because I think people, diff- different people react to uh, grief and loss differently, right? Like some people want to like hold up and like uh, withdraw from the world for a while and kind of just process things on their own. Some people like want to get out there and be super social. Like only way to get over someone is to get under someone else, like mm-hmm. that type of stuff. <laughs> like, and it's really kind of like up to you to have a conversation. Like, you know, how would you like to feel supported? Do you want to talk about it? Yeah, like, and I think also it's important to uh, not take things personally. I think I think it can be very easy to like center yourself. Like, if your partner is like going through a breakup and they're grieving that and like being like really mopey all day, uh, then you'll be like, oh, what does this mean for our relationship? Like, are they going to be sad like that if we broke up and kind of make comparisons in that sense and go and be like and feel uncomfortable with like how intensely like their grief um, is kind of being experienced. And that can be hard for some people. And I think like, it's appropriate if like, you, you don't want to see that. And you're like, you know, I, as much as like, I empathize with your grief in this situation, like I would prefer if you talked to your friends about it or talk to a therapist, um, because like, I don't feel that I'm able to support you while also kind of looking after myself. Right. Mm-hmm. But then like in situations where like, you are kind of comfortable with it and you do want to support your partner, then I think it's just best to ask them for what they need. And I think for the person who has been broken up with, for the person who is kind of going through that, it's very important, uh, firstly, to, you know, be mindful of how, like, this is impacting your other relationships. Like, you know, you may be, like, acting a little bit differently for a period of time. And it's it's difficult to maintain and be, like, happy in other relationships when you're also simultaneously going through, like, this very difficult time, right? And I would also say that, uh, secondly, it's really important to not try and um so okay so in in monogamy there's this idea of the rebound right like you have a breakup and then you try and like fill that void with someone else immediately and i feel that there is an there is an equivalent of that in polyamory where like for example like if you have a divorce um and then you also have another partner uh some people like in order to kind of fill that void like want to like get married to their other partner immediately to try and like fill uh, to fill that void and escalate that relationship even if like they're not actually necessarily like compatible as like married uh kind of or like living together or whatever like because they're trying to kind of replace that role that like the relationship that just ended um kind of played in their life you know at the end of these things like you know question like are you making this decision because like you're trying to fill a void or do you actually like want to like progress this connection with this specific person like are you are you chasing them or are you chasing an idea like i see this like chasing ideas and kind of like wanting to like see a different version of yourself rather than like actually caring about the person that you're engaging with and like you know seeing them as an individual in their own right with like you know their own like desires and fears and whatever like I think that's always really important to keep in mind definitely yeah well now sounds like a perfect time to dig into this letter so if you don't mind I will go ahead and take a stab at reading we have dear damsels I've been married to my husband for five years. We have a beautiful son who is three and a newborn. During my second pregnancy, I began to feel bored with my life and felt like it was missing passion. I had always strived for this cookie cutter life and now that I had it, it felt like I had done everything wrong. I love my husband and my kids, but I just want to make a change to open myself up to a more passionate and exciting existence. I had friends who were polyamorous and they said it changed their lives. It's something I'm interested in, but I'm deeply afraid of freaking out my husband and breaking up my family. I'm especially afraid of setting a bad example for my children. How do I make this choice or any other choice feasible for my life without reservations and looking back? Best, petrified of Polly. Petrified. Um, I think like the first thing to address here is like, if, the issue here is kind of um, 
that you feel your life is boring and that it's lacking passion and that kind of thing I would really caution against um kind of trying to find that passion elsewhere before you try and kind of work on it with your existing partner Mm -hmm. and I think that like exploring non-monogamy and polyamory is about maintaining multiple relationships uh, and like you know really kind of like honoring the commitments you've made in each relationship rather than going like well I can't be asked to work on this here and it's easier to find it somewhere else I'm just going to run off and I'm not necessarily saying that that's kind of exactly what's happening here but then I'm worried that it will turn into that without like kind of uh, some extra consideration because I think too often um, people kind of do the thing that is easy which is kind of like cultivating like desire and passion with like a new person rather than kind of uh trying to like keep the spark alive in an existing relationship and that can cause a lot of conflict later on so then like I would say yeah you know if you want to explore non-monogamy sure do that but then like don't do that at the expense of like neglecting um kind of the issue with like passion that is that is in your relationship because like opening up won't fix that it won't save that I think too often like people like open up relationships because they think that you know adding another person in is somehow going to like resolve like the mess that they're already in and like it only gets more complicated from there I think if you're already experiencing challenges it's good to kind of have a good look at that and exhaust all the options before like venturing into that territory because that's going to open up like a whole Pandora's box of things whether it's about yourself your partner or your relationship I'm not a parent I'm not married but then like I think it's I think it can be very common um in from what I've seen anyway people in these relationships to kind of feel like oh you know they're being saddled with so much responsibility and stress Mm -hmm. and they just kind of want to have a bit of fun and they can they can kind of outsource that fun elsewhere desire and fun and joyful play is like and quality time is important in all kinds of relationships like you don't want to be in a situation where like you see your husband as like the, the 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 secure calm like responsible partner and then you see someone else as like the fun kind of like passionate partner because you know I think ideally you'd want to cultivate a bit of both in both relationships um and I think that resentment will end up building over time if like your husband is like okay like I'm holding the fort and I'm looking after the kids and whatever and you know you're kind of just going off and like someone else is reaping the benefits and while obviously there is value in like a long-term relationship, but there is value in like living together and like the day-to-day kind of like mundane responsibilities and, you know, childcare and that kind of thing. Like I'm sure people derive a lot of joy and fulfillment from that. I think at the end of the day, like people like variety, people like fun um, and, uh, you know, people want to let loose once in a while. So then ultimately what you should be trying to cultivate um, passion in, uh, in your existing relationship as well as any new relationships that you intend to create rather than kind of just going like well I'm going to outsource this thing I'm going to get it there I would very much caution against kind of using other relationships as like escapism um, yeah I, I completely agree with you another thought that I was having when reading this is at least in the U.S. and I'm not sure if it's similar in the U.K. but especially for young women there's a lot of pressure to get married early I don't think that that's like really left even as society progresses and I've been speaking with a lot of my super goal oriented friends and a lot of them talk about how, you know, you graduate high school, you graduate college, maybe you go to grad school, you get a great job, and then it's time to like get married and have kids like it feels like the natural next step. And maybe either if you have trouble reaching that next step, or if you get to that next step, and then you realize what happens after here, I think that that is hard for a lot of really goal oriented people, which it sounds like this person is. The other thing that I was thinking about is that it might not just be an issue with your husband. And I know that that's like sort of odd for me to be saying on a dating podcast, but I would also think about like what else is happening in your own life? Like, are you excited by your career? Are you excited by your friendships? Like, are you doing a lot of other things to also increase passion and existence? Because one of the things that you brought up, Leanne, is that love isn't everything. And love isn't the one thing that's meant to fix all of our problems. So what are other ways that you can cultivate passion? One of the things that I would also think about is, is there any um, like postpartum depression going on here? Because I think that that's something to think about um, with a newborn, that it, it might not be necessarily about your life, but something that's going on that many women go through. I'm pretty sure that my mom went through this right after having a child. So I would just be easy with yourself. And 
one of the things that I also noticed, and I know I've said this multiple times now, is you're afraid of setting a bad example for your children. And if right now you're considering polyamory with some negative connotations, I feel like that's a really bad time to then go enter a polyamorous relationship. If you're judging it as a choice for your children, then naturally you're going to judge it as a choice for yourself. So if I were you, I would do everything Leanne said with looking into your relationship with your partner. I would also investigate what's happening in your life and where you can cultivate more passion within your life and then see how you're feeling in a year or two and maybe even talk with a therapist or your doctor to see if this could also be something with postpartum. I think to add to that, uh, to both of your great feedback is I, I'm caught up by the sentence where petrified says I had always strived for this cookie cutter life and now that I had it it felt like I'd done everything wrong I feel like that false expectation that everything's going to be perfect or that everything that you work toward is going to be perfect, that I think you know being cautious of uh, those lofty expectations and just kind of like appreciating where you're at now is really important. And I think communicating those thoughts with the husband is going to be equally important so that, you know, you build that strong foundation for the kids so that you are setting a strong example. Because again, going back to communication, it's just like, it helps not only the adults in the situation, but also the kids in this scenario. So yeah, and I want to add on to that, like that particular sentence uh, that you that you brought up, Alejandro, like, you know, living this kind of cookie cutter life and kind of feeling like, you know, you made all the wrong choices or whatever, or you could have made different ones. And I think the grass is always greener, firstly. But then also, and I'm going back to something else that Esther Perel said, so I'm just, I quote her a lot because I love her. <laughs> um, but then um, oh. Esther Perel talked about, and to be fair, like she said this in the context of infidelity. Um, so it's not quite the same thing. But then I think the wisdom still applies. Like where she said that when people kind of like seek um, partners like outside of their relationship um, often they're not turning towards another partner but they're turning towards another version of themselves so it's not like the other per the other person that they're specifically desiring but then the person that they can be while that they're uh, there with this person and I, I thought I thought that was so spot on um, and I think that like in this situation you know if you are kind of going out to seek other partners to like kind of fix the boredom in your life like I worry petrified that you're going to be objectifying people for like the kind of purpose and value that they bring to you rather than like appreciating them as like whole individuals I worry that like you know this this kind of exploration will become very purpose-driven and that you'll see people purely for like what they bring to you and what they fulfill and like yeah. if they don't fulfill that those needs then they don't have bring value and they're not worth it like th that's kind of what I'm concerned about with this wording um because you know people kind of don't exist to kind of like fulfill your needs like at least that's not their sole purpose in life right I think like every relationship comes with its pros and cons and like it's about kind of accepting like the fullness of that um so yeah I would kind of there's there's a couple of things here that I would encourage petrified to think about before they like make this big step because it's not an easy one um and I think there's a couple of things to do some introspection on before um uh, taking that leap absolutely I think that's so great <laughs> I love what you're saying about that it's not people's sole existence um, to make you happy or to be, you know, fulfillment. And I think exactly what you were saying with the wording of this letter, it has the implication that it's that you haven't done everything with this particular partner yet, and that it could just be more about what's happening in your life. Because I think it would be a different story if this person said to us, like, I've been working with my husband for years, and we haven't been able to like cultivate passion anymore. And it was all about your relationship with your partner, then I think, you know, thinking about polyamory would be a phenomenal choice. But it doesn't sound like that's where you are right now. It doesn't sound like you've done all the work. It just sounds like you heard about this and then thought it could be a great idea. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I would agree with that. Well, Leanne, is there anything else that you wanted to let our listeners know about polyamory or non-monogamy? Or maybe you can share with us where our listeners can find you on the intro. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I like, you know, my, my, my followers ask me lots of questions like every day, all the time. Um, and so you can find like an FAQ where I've answered people's uh, kind of most burning questions, like over a hundred of them, um, like on, on my profile, like in the link in my bio. So like I have an FAQ link to that, but if you kind of want me to want to find me on social media, um, my handle is polyphilia blog. That is P O L Y P H I L I A B L O G. Uh, I am on Instagram. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. Facebook and I'm on TikTok, um, all the same handle. Um, and so, yeah, you can find me in any of those platforms. I post content on all of the platforms on a regular basis. Um, if you're interested in booking like a private peer support uh, session with me, I offer um, sessions to individuals, couples, and groups, either over text or over video call, where you can kind of talk to me in a safe and judgment free space about anything to do with non monogamy, whether you're like opening up or like you're kind of struggling with meeting your partner's partners or like you're going through a breakup, like literally anything related to that. And I have a shop where I sell merch. I sell polyamory merch on Redbubble. Um, that's also kind of linked um, in like in my in my various kind of social media profiles. And yeah, yeah, thank you so much for, for having me. I really enjoyed um, kind of talking with you about polyamory and like the advice question was like so great to dive into. It's been amazing having you on. Thank you so much for making time to come on to the podcast. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for all of your content that you've been creating. I feel like it's so short, so funny, and um, really makes like polyamory and non-monogamy accessible for people who may have not heard about it or know anything about it previously. So I really want to thank you for sharing that with us and sharing a little bit about your story. Thank you so much. Like accessibility is really important to me because I'm autistic and I know that a lot of polyamorous people are neurodivergent. Um, so like having short bite-sized content is kind of my main focus. Yeah, I love that. All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Damsels in the DMs. Until next time. It's going down in the DMs. Bye. DMs, DMs. We don't need them. We just leave them. Please. Yeah. It's going down in the DMs. Bye.